In space, it's important to have the right attitude. No, I don't mean the mental state, although that is critical too. By attitude, I mean spacecraft orientation. Often that's done by using thrusters on a spacecraft, but for large, long-term vehicles, something more sustainable is needed. Control moment gyroscopes. The International Space Station has four of these, and they are all on one of the most critical components of the outpost, the Z-1 truss. Not only did this element provide a temporary mounting point for the first set of massive solar arrays for the ISS, it also serves as a communications hub and is a major source of attitude control for the entire complex. The Z-1 truss was the fourth element added to the fledgling ISS. I've already done videos about the first three modules. You can see a playlist here. Be sure to give them a watch and a like. Also, be sure to smash the like button on this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Now, let's get right into talking about the first truss component added to the ISS. The Z-1 truss was the first permanent latticework structure for the International Space Station. It was critical to get this piece installed as it would pave the way for the beginning of permanent crewed operations and serve as a temporary mounting location for the P-6 truss segment, which brought the first major set of solar arrays and radiators to the ISS. P-6 remained attached to the Z-1 truss until its relocation in 2007, during the final missions to build the space station's giant 100-meter-long integrated truss structure. Overall, the Z-1 truss is about 4.5 meters wide and about 4 meters deep. It's also about 4 meters tall, not counting the large antenna booms. It has a mass of about 8,700 kilograms, which includes four control moment gyroscopes, or CMGs, a KU band antenna assembly as well as an S band antenna, an active common berthing mechanism and a manual berthing mechanism, and two plasma connectors designed to neutralize static electrical charge on the space station. It also has attach points for other hardware, including power converters, early thermal control units, and tools for spacewalks. There's even a small pressurized dome to allow for various connections with the ISS to be made in a shirt sleeve environment. It also has a side benefit of offering a little bit of storage space. The truss was built by Boeing for a cost of about $273 million. Its main framework is made of aluminum, while its antenna boom is made of steel. It was launched into space inside Space Shuttle Discovery's payload bay on October 11, 2000, during mission STS-92. Liftoff took place from Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A in Florida and was the 100th flight of NASA's Space Shuttle program. Riding along with it was a third pressurized mating adapter for the space station, which would be used during the next two assembly missions in order to add more components to the growing outpost. Once docked to the three-module ISS, Discovery's seven-person astronaut crew used the orbiter's robotic canadarm to grab Z-1 from its place in the payload bay and carefully move it into a berthing position on the space-facing, or zenith, port of the Unity module. It would require a pair of astronauts on a spacewalk to ready the massive KU band antenna boom for deployment as well as perform various other relocation tasks to install Z-1 to the ISS. Once securely attached to the space station, a hatch leading to the truss dome was opened so that astronauts could connect various power and data cables to Unity. A second spacewalk was required to detach the PMA-3 docking adapter from its payload bay mount before the robotic arm was used to attach it to the Earth-facing port of Unity. Two other spacewalks were performed by STS-92 astronauts during their nearly seven days of docked operations in order to ready the Z-1 truss for utilization. This included moving various pieces of the structure to make way for future module additions, as well as the deployment of a cable tray, which would be used to connect various power and data cables, as well as fluid lines, to the eventual integrated truss assembly and other future components. Throughout the ISS assembly over the years, this tray would become known as the rat's nest, as it would become an increasingly crowded junction. While the space station was now ready for its first full-time cruise, there would not be enough power to heat the Z-1 truss and the Unity module properly until the delivery of the P-6 truss two months after this addition. As a result, the Russian segment used its thrusters to orient the outpost to allow for solar heating on Unity and Z-1 as well as its gyroscopes until the first massive array wings were delivered. When the STS-92 crew undocked on October 20, 2000, it was the final time an uninhabited ISS was departed from. The first full-time crew, Expedition 1, would arrive at the outpost via a Soyuz spacecraft just two weeks later. It would be in February 2001, during the installation of the Destiny Laboratory module, before the control moment gyroscopes would be activated. Once activated, the four control moment gyroscopes, each with a mass of about 300 kilograms, began to provide the bulk of attitude control as the ISS orbited Earth. 
Inside each of these devices is a large flat steel wheel that spins at a constant speed of about 6,600 rotations per minute. The wheel is mounted in a two degree of freedom gimbal system that allows software to move the spin axis in any direction. Without getting too deep into the weeds, the system works by turning a constantly spinning wheel to change its angular momentum. This imparts a torque, or twisting force, on the ISS. With multiple wheels, this allows the space station to be moved into new attitudes or positions, or be held in a constant orientation. If you've ever seen someone on Earth holding a spinning bicycle wheel on a rotating chair, you've seen this concept in action. The YouTube channel Simply Space did a great explainer video on how to steer the ISS. You can watch it right here, also there's a link in the description. There are various torques acting on the ISS throughout its orbit. The two primary forces are from the minimal atmospheric drag applied on the large solar rays and radiators, and gravity gradients, creating a rotation relative to Earth about the outpost's center of mass. Software and ground-based teams work to balance these forces over the course of a full orbit. This is known as a torque equilibrium attitude, or TEA. The main TEA used is the LVLH attitude, or local vertical, local horizontal. This means the inertial reference point for the outpost is defined as Earth's surface. However, this system has its limitations, and the gyroscopes can become saturated, which means the overall torque on the ISS is greater than what the control moment gyroscopes can counteract. This isn't an ideal situation, so when the gyroscopes are about 80% of the way towards saturation, thrusters on the Russian side of the ISS can be fired to cancel out torque generated by the CMGs while they are reset by the guidance software. Control moment gyroscopes can also be used to change the attitude of the ISS to a different orientation relative to Earth, but this is a slow process that often requires thruster assist from the Russian segment in order to desaturate the system. According to NASA, the fastest the ISS can rotate is about a tenth of a degree per second, meaning it'd take about 30 minutes to turn 180 degrees. Z1 also serves as the location for the primary communications hardware on the ISS. It launched with a single KU antenna boom and an S-band antenna. The S-band system provides data and voice processing for downlink and uplink. The KU band system is the primary return link for ISS video and payload data in digital format to the ground. It does so by using a space-to-ground receiver controller to transmit data to NASA's tracking and data relay satellite system in geosynchronous Earth orbit which is then bounced to appropriate ground stations and ultimately sent it to Mission Control in Houston. A second KU band antenna and a space-to-ground receiver were launched in 2010 and attached to the Z-1 truss. This, as well as various other upgrades to the ISS over its two decades, have increased its up and down link capability to around 600 megabits per second. Looking forward, the hardware and software being used on Z-1 and other components around the ISS to support the up and down link of data for astronauts, engineers, and scientists is giving NASA valuable insights for how to transmit large amounts of data back to Earth. These designs and their upgrades, and similar ones in the future, are expected to go into NASA's designs for communications and control of the future Learned Gateway Outpost, which the agency hopes to be orbiting around the Moon by the middle of this decade. The Z-1 truss is a critical component for the daily operation of the ISS. While I didn't get into too much detail about the various subsystems for this video, would such a deep dive of these topics be of interest to you for a future video? Let me know in the comments below. And if I've earned it, it'd mean the world to me if you could subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and share this video as well as others with friends and family. It helps support the channel and lets me know what topics you're interested in regarding human space exploration. You can also follow Orbital Velocity on Twitter and Facebook. Additionally, you can visit orbital-velocity.com for even more space-related content, including a monthly newsletter called The Space Capsule. Links are in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, Ad Astra.